So welcome again to our uh, Computer Science Alumni and Friends Virtual Public Lecture Series. This is the fourth in the series. And there will be a recording of the of the of the tonight's presentation made available uh, after the fact. So first, let me welcome you. A warm virtual welcome to members and friends of the University of Regina and its three federated colleges, the First Nations University of Canada, Campion College and Luther College. The University of Regina is situated on Treaty 4 lands with the presence of Treaty 6 lands. These are the territories of the Cree, Soto, Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota, and the homeland of the Métis Michif Nation. Today, these lands continue to be the shared territory of many diverse peoples from near and far. So a little, bit of, a little bit about the Department of Computer Science. So the final approval to create the Department of Computer Science was granted back in November of 1968. Some of the first graduates of the program convocated in 1974 as the University of, this is, as the University of Saskatchewan Regina campus became the University of Regina. And Larry Symes, who was an alumnus of the Regina campus, was the first department head. So if you enjoy these, as I said, this is the fourth event in our virtual public lecture series. And we'll look to organize another one in spring. If you have some feedback or suggestions, please send them along to me, Daryl Hepting. There's my email address. So I'm a professor in the Department of Computer Science and I'm also an alumnus who went to school with, uh, with our guest tonight. So to, let me tell you about our guest. Dr. Mitchell is the Alberta Health Services Chair in AI and Health, a professor in the Department of Medicine, an adjunct professor in the Department of Computer Science both at, at the University of Alberta. He's a fellow with the Alberta Machine Inst Intelligence, Inst I'm sorry, a fellow with the Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute and the Senior Program Director of the Artificial Intelligence Adoption uh, Program within the Alberta Health Services. Ross received his PhD from the University of Western Ontario after receiving a high honors degree and a master's of science in computer science from the University of Regina. He has been working in the fields of biomedical imaging, artificial intelligence, and machine learning for 30 years. So with that, uh, please help me welcome Ross to talk to us about artificial intelligence for precision healthcare. Thanks, Daryl. <clears throat> I'm just gonna start my presentation here. Make sure that you can see it and hear me. Is everything okay? You can, can you see it and hear me? We've got a few, one yes. Two yes, three yes. We have many yeses now. Okay. So I think we're all set. Okay, <clears throat> yeah, just to make sure I'm sharing the computer sound. Okay, so uh, yeah, this is me. Thanks, Daryl, for the nice introduction. Um, so uh, a quick summary of where I, uh, of me over the last couple of decades, I uh, finished my PhD, like Daryl said, at Western University, and then I was a faculty member there in radiology and medical biophysics. Uh, in 2000, I moved from there to the University of Calgary, where I was a uh, faculty member in radiology and clinical neurosciences. I was in Calgary for 11 years, uh, and then I was recruited to move to Mayo Clinic in Arizona and uh, set up a division of medical imaging informatics in uh, the Department of Radiology at Mayo. And I was at Mayo for about eight and a half years, and I got the opportunity to go to Moffitt and become their inaugural artificial intelligence officer for the organization. Uh, Moffitt, a lot of people may not have heard of it, it's the third uh, largest cancer center in the U.S. by patient volume after MD Anderson and Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York. 
Um, so it's, uh, and it's the only um, National Cancer Institute designated comprehensive cancer center in the state of Florida. Uh, so I was there for about two and a half years and the opportunity came, arose to come back to Canada and join a group that I uh, have a lot of admiration for, which is the AI group uh, and, and the clinical group in Edmonton at the University of Alberta. So we packed our bags uh, and we left Tampa on December 5th last year. It was about plus 25. And uh, at the airport, we put on our parkas. We landed in Edmonton a few hours later and it was like minus 38. <laughs> so uh, qu quite, quite a change. But um, I grew up in Saskatchewan, uh, like Daryl said, went to school there. So it, it's a bit of getting used to, but I think uh, we're well on our way. So the, the goal of my career has always been the development and actual translation into clinical use of tools, informatics tools to help improve the efficiency of healthcare. And really a lot of that's focused on artificial intelligence and machine learning. So today I'm just gonna talk about three things. That's it, uh, quick three things. And it, it's different types of uh, AI technology and their applications uh, to medicine. So the three sort of large overarching developments in this field I'm going to talk about are convolutional neural nets, reinforcement learning, and transformers. And if you haven't heard of those before, that's fine. I'll uh, introduce them. It's This is a high-level talk. There's no equations here, uh, no, no detailed algorithms or anything. It's, it's uh, hopefully very uh, approachable and understandable. So number one, deep convolutional neural nets, often abbreviated as a CNN. And the primary application I'm going to talk about is to medical imaging. So what's a CNN? Well, we'll go back a few years before they were really popular. They existed, but um, they weren't as powerful as they are for a reason that we'll get into in a moment. Um, this is a CAPTCHA or something that you had to do online to prove that you were human back in 2007. And you may remember this, they show you pictures of cats and dogs and ask you to click on the pictures of the cats and not the dogs. And a side effect of this was lots of cats got adopted because uh, they partnered with PetFinder to try and get some of these animals uh, adopted into homes. It was quite successful. But the, the problem behind it is that um, it's really, at the time, it's really, really difficult for uh, computers to tell the difference between a photo of a cat and a photo of a dog. Humans can do it perfectly in under 30 seconds. Uh, and this was a, a long-standing uh, contest that they had in computer science. And the, this paper that was published in 2007, uh, the author stated at the end, you know, we believe that computer separation or identification of cats versus dogs is going to uh, be better than 60%, which was around the state of the art at the time with 60% accuracy, is going to be difficult with some kind of significant advancement in the state of the art. So, you know, about half the time, a little better than half the time, they got it wrong and a human can do it perfectly in a few seconds. That was the state of the art in 2007. Well, fast forward six years and it still uh, was a major issue. In fact, uh, Kaggle, which is a major um, machine learning competition site and a lot of the competitions are sponsored by industry and come with cash prizes for the winners. And they maintain a leaderboard of who's got the best solution out there right now. Uh, anybody can join these competitions. The data is provided for you. You download it, build your uh, system and try and um, solve the problem that they posed. Well, this problem was posted in 2013, basically the exact same thing. And on the problem page, it says, in this competition, you write an algorithm to classify whether images contain either a dog or a cat. This is easy for humans, dogs and cats. Your computer will find it a bit more difficult. So this uh, competition was launched in 2013 and literally a year later, they had to shut it down because they had a ton of algorithms that were basically perfect, 99% uh, and above at being able to differentiate cats from dogs. So between 2007 and 2014, seven years, it went from something that was considered intractable, uh, while well, they said it would have to involve a change in the state of the art and a change did occur. <laughs> what, what happened, we'll, we'll talk about that. What happened was convolutional neural nets running on um, computer graphic gaming cards. And this was driven by this, uh, another challenge called the ImageNet challenge, which was uh, driven out of uh, a professor at Stanford. She got together 14 million images from around the internet 
and used crowdsourcing to label them into 22,000 different categories. And high level categories included things like plants, animals, food, people, structures, um, transportation, cars and trains and things like that. So you could download these images and train your algorithm to try and predict what class a particular image belonged to. And um, this, they would measure the image classification accuracy over time. And it, it hovered around 70 to below 75%. So think, you know, one in every four images it got wrong. Um, and if you looked at what people were capable of doing, if you or I just looked at these images, uh, we would probably get between 85 and 90%, correct? And if we spent some time studying them, because, you know, some, some pictures are sometimes a little bit tough to tell, but if you'd spent some time, devoted some time to studying up on it, you could probably get up to 95% or a little bit better. So even humans aren't perfect at this, which you can imagine, 14 million images, there's going to be some variability in there. But uh, computers were performing far, far less proficiently than a, a typical human or a human expert. But in 2012, a whole, the whole paradigm shifted and a group from the University of Toronto used these convolutional neural networks running on a gaming graphics card. And the reason they ran on the gaming card was to get the computational power that they needed. They realized that they could parallelize this and run it on this hardware and get it to perform something besides rendering a video game. Really, really uh, interesting concept. So this was the first time that deep convolutional neural networks were used. And they got about a 10% improvement in performance that year. And that really shook things up. It made a lot of people around the world stand up and take notice. Uh, uh, people like uh, the leaders of Google and Baidu and Amazon and Microsoft and those kinds of corporations and NVIDIA, um, they all sort of said, wow, this is something's going on here. And after that, the competition continued and every winning solution for the next couple of years was based on a deep convolutional neural network. And you got pretty much linear improvement year over year until 2015. The computer became better than a human expert even at <clears throat> classifying these images. <clears throat> and they basically had to shut the competition down because the algorithms are so good now. So what do these things look like? Tr go through this quickly. This is uh, a very popular and powerful uh, <clears throat> convolutional neural network. And on the left is an image. It's an image of a uh, a slide, a histology slide. The blue layers perform mathematical operations on the pixels in the image, and they basically learn to extract features of interest. And the feature could be a line, it could be a little patch of texture, a bright blob, a dark blob. They learn to pick out these features, and those features get passed up to the next higher layer. So if you start at, con at layer one, way over on the left, it might learn lines the lines would get passed up to layer two, and it might use the lines to identify corners. And corners might get passed up to an, a higher layer, and it might learn to identify shapes. And at the same time, different parts of this are learning to differentiate a smooth texture from a coarse texture. The red layers are in place to select the best features that help uh, solve the task at hand. And in this case, the, the task is, what is this image? Is it a cat or a dog? So as you go further from the left to the right, the features become more abstract, uh, but they also uh, are better suited at differentiating or solving the task at hand. And I'll give you an example. We're actually gonna look inside this network and see what the various layers are responding to. And very, very low down in the network at the, at the early layers, uh, it's responding to edges. You can see basically there's, there's texture and there's also edge orientation here and it's, and it's full color. So that's interesting. If you go up a few layers in the network, you can see it's still very much texture based, but there's a lot more, the edges are even more interesting and the textures are more interesting. So it's starting to detect higher level things. And this really starts to show when you go up to level 30 in this network and you can see the sort of things it's responding to are leaves and feathers and boxes and things that look like blobs, bubbles. Well, if you go up another 10 layers in the network, this is actually one of the uh, one of the layers and what it responds to. And when I saw this, I thought, wow, this is really cool. If we take an image of cats, let's say, 
you can see that the net, this, this um, system has learned to identify things that are very cat-like. And remember, no one's programmed this. It's learned this by being shown thousands and thousands of images of cats and being asked to, here's an image of a cat, what do you predict it to be? And it learns over time to predict it's a cat, not a dog, it's a cat, not an airplane, and so on and so forth. But it's just through this being shown images, millions of images and iterating millions and millions of times, it starts to tune what it looks for in these images. And it learns to pull out these features. And at high levels in the network, it's pulling out features that to us look like a kitten or a cat's ear. So no wonder it does a good job of differentiating cats from dogs. So these have just exploded in application. And a lot of the things that you hear about AI and medicine are based on these convolutional neural networks. And a lot of them have to do with medical imaging. So things that we've done and lots of people have done um, is to train these things to differentiate normal and abnormal images. This is a picture of a normal brain and one with a brain tumor. Easy for us to pick this out. Well, it's now easy for a computer to pick this out. And this can be useful to, to screen images and rank them for, for um, reading by the radiologist. The, the network could say, here's one I think you should look at. It looks like there's something wrong. Um, why don't you read this one first instead of these other 10 that look normal? So that can help with workflow. Another thing is uh, to identify pathology in the image. This is another image of a brain tumor, that white blob that you see, finger-like blob is a brain tumor. And we would like to know where that is and how big it is for uh, treating it. Either we're cutting it out in surgery or treating it with radiotherapy. So it's very useful to be able to automatically paint that in and say, here's where the tumor is, as opposed to uh, normal surrounding tissue. And right now this is done uh, largely by hand, although more and more uh, deep neural networks are being used to outline these lesions. And um, this is from a uh, code that I wrote a couple of years ago uh, to segment brain tumors at Mayo Clinic. And it also uh, extracts the brain <clears throat> from, from the MRI scan. And once we've done things like that, we can start taking some of the features that the NETS learned and using, the, using those to associate or correlate with very specific predictions about the lesion. So in the first image, um, we've taught the system to identify a particular type of brain tumor. This is an oligodendroglioma versus a glioblastoma or an astrocytoma. Once we know it's an oligodendroglioma, we might ask it, well, <clears throat> what does it have this particular genetic characteristic, 1P19Q intact or deleted, which is very important for, for treatment. And once you know that, then you can start combining it with other things in the electronic health record to predict survival. Will this patient live beyond 120 days or not? Things like that. So these are the kinds of tools that we've been, been building. Okay, um, <clears throat> second thing I'm going to talk about, uh, reinforcement learning. Uh, and this is uh, another really cool area. And it has all kinds of applications in medicine, basically anything to do with planning, treatment planning, surgical planning. I'm going to talk about radiotherapy treatment planning in particular. So reinforcement really got its, uh, its, its, its birth or its was really developed by a fellow here at the University of Alberta by the name of Richard Sutton. Um, and he's, he's a, a colleague of mine in the Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute. And he's very, very well known around the AI world for his work. Um, his textbook on the, on, the su on the subject has been cited over 50,000 times, uh, just his textbook. And he's got a, an enormously high H index, um, very, very prolific and well-cited scientist. And uh, reinforcement learning, you can think of it as, for example, teaching a rat to navigate a maze or a mouse to navigate a maze. If we have a mouse here on the left in a maze, the mouse wants to learn how to navigate this to find a reward at the end. But along the way, um, there could also be uh, negative feedback. There could be traps and dangers and, and uh, places where the mouse could get lost. So it has, to, it has both positive and negative feedback as it tries to navigate this this maze to, to find the reward. <clears throat> and if you put a mouse in a maze like this, it'll pretty quickly learn to navigate through and get the cheese at the end, get its reward. Now, once you've, the mouse has learned to navigate the maze, if you then a couple of days later put it back in the maze, the mouse has a decision to make. Should I just run quickly to the end and get my reward? Or should I spend some time 
exploring other areas of the maze I may have not explored yet. Because what if there's an even bigger piece of cheese somewhere else? And this is the conundrum that's described as the explore exploit trade off. Should I just exploit my knowledge and get my reward, or should I devote some of my effort to exploring unseen things? And there's no clear way to answer this question, and it's a lot about what this field is, is about. How do you optimize this trade-off? When do you exploit and when do you explore? Well, one of the most famous groups in the world to leverage reinforcement learning is DeepMind, based in London, UK. And uh, they famously used reinforcement learning to teach a computer to play the game of Go. Can you hear this? Yeah, that's an exciting move. Mm -hmm. I, I think we've seen an original move here. They said all is to go what Roger Federer is to tennis. Huge shock. Headlines around the world. 60 million people watched the game in China alone. For us, it's the combination of a 20 year dream. Oh, that was a huge moment. Well, okay, we've beaten the, uh, the world champion. How could we go further? You know, what could we learn from that? There are so many possible application domains where creativity in a different dimension to what humans could do could be immensely valuable to us. And the search time is getting better and better like as we go from, for example, one to eight. And anyone... There's been a big chain of events that followed on from all of the excitement of AlphaGo. <laughs> when we played against Lisa Doll, we actually had a system that had been trained on, on human data, on all of the millions of games that had been played by human experts. We eventually found a, a new algorithm, a much more elegant approach to the whole system, which actually stripped out all of the human knowledge and just started completely from scratch. Instead of learning from human data, it learned from its own games, and that became a project which we called AlphaZero. Zero meaning having zero human knowledge in the loop. AlphaZero is a kind of experiment in how little knowledge can we put into these systems and how quickly and how efficiently can they learn. The next stage was to make it more general so that it could play any two-player game, not just Go, but things like chess and shogi, which is Japanese chess, and in fact any kind of two-player perfect information game. What we discovered was that actually this exceeded all of our expectations. Alpha Zero could start in the morning playing completely randomly and then by tea it would be superhuman level, by dinner it would be the strongest chess entity there's ever been. After about eight or nine hours it was strong enough to be able to go out and defeat Stockfish, the incumbent world champion, a program which was vastly stronger than Deep Blue, the program which had previously defeated Kasparov. Traditional chess engines like Stockfish basically consist of a huge database of rules. Alpha Zero doesn't have any rules. It learns through experience. You know, we, we're trying to build general algorithms, not just to play chess, not just to play Go. The world's a messy place, and no one can exactly write down the rules by which it operates. We can work with energy systems in the real world, with healthcare systems in the real world. So they mentioned it, uh, and one of the areas that I'm really interested, uh, and many others are interested in applying this, is for uh, uh, doing treatment planning or surgical planning in, in hospitals. So if we look at uh, radiotherapy treatment planning, this is where a physician, a radiation oncologist will say, I've identified a tumor inside the patient and I would like you, the physicist and the dosimetrist to apply a certain dose to a certain region. And um, this is something I think we could be uh, highly automated through reinforcement learning. So if the radiotherapy treatment planning system is a piece of software that uh, is used in hospitals to plan the treatment, to plan how the radiation will be delivered to a portion of the human anatomy. And these now are programmable. You can control them from software. The inputs don't have to come from a person at a keyboard and a screen. You can control them through another piece of software. So effectively, when that happens, they become like a game engine. It's like you're sending inputs into this black box and the output it produces is a treatment plan. And here, the colored lines show various intensities of radiation. And they're over different parts of, in this case, a lung tumor. 
And the plan is the output from the system is meant to try and approach what a radiation oncologist has specified as their prescription. They're saying, here's the region I want you to treat in red, and here's a region that I don't want you to treat in blue. And what's interesting is we can take the prescribed plan and the produced plan and compare them and come up with a metric, which is like a score. You can come up with a single quantitative value that sort of estimates the overall quality of the plan. And if you feed that back into the learning agent, you're giving feedback to the mouse in the maze, essentially. It's like the game of Go. You learn the rules. You have certain parameters that you can tune. You get an output. The output is scored. And based on that, you figure out whether you did better or worse than the last iteration. And you do this millions of times, and you can learn to, to produce a treatment plan very, very quickly that's very, very good. Well, why would we want to do this? Well, currently, it takes a long time. It can take several days to come up with a really good treatment plan. And so it's not done very frequently. A lot of patients will get treatment over many weeks and they'll get just a single treatment plan at the beginning. But over those weeks, as the radiation takes effect and they get better or they get sicker or they're just responding to the, the treatment itself, their body changes, their, the geometry of their organs change. And yet the plan isn't necessarily updated. With a system that could generate a plan in a minute, maybe less, uh, you could have the patient come in today, get scanned, and tune the plan immediately before they go down to the linear accelerator room to get treatment. And this would really customize the treatment to that patient and what's happening in their body right now. And it would dramatically improve the effectiveness and positive outcomes from radiotherapy. So uh, not the first one to think of this. In fact, there's over 1,500 publications on exactly this topic. But I think there's things that we could add uh, at the University of Alberta. I'm not going to go into them in too much detail, but they have to do a specific technology developed here and certain information that we have that we could use to um, uh, optimize the treatment plan, not based just on the prescription, but also on the, the outcome and how the patient feels as they're going through the, uh, the treatment process. Okay, uh, the last thing I want to talk about actually has a couple of parts to it. Uh, the, the, the technique is called transformers, and there's three applications I'd like to talk about. Uh, medical text, protein folding, and medical images again. So transformers were, oh, I'll let the animation play here. Transformers were originally developed for natural language processing. They're fundamentally a language tool. And Human language is complex. Uh, English is the language I know. Those, that's the example I'll use. And in fact, it's the first and largest application of this technology is to the English language. Um, but uh, originally, transformers were used to translate uh, one language to another. So you might give it English in and get French out or German out or vice versa. When we look at language, uh, for example, English, and we take a, a sentence like this, the trophy did not fit in the suitcase because it was too small. What does the word it refer to in this case? Well, it's not hard. It refers to the suitcase. But I'm going to now change just one word in this sentence. And it's the last word. The trophy did not fit in the suitcase because it was too large. Now, what does it refer to? Obviously, the trophy. This is simple for humans to do and really difficult for computers to do. It sounds a lot like that dog versus cat challenge from 2007. Um, this is called co-reference resolution. It's a classic case of an issue in natural language processing that computers have to be taught to do. Um, it's trivial for a human to do. It's tough for a computer to do until late 2018 when uh, Google published a new algorithm. To figure this out, you have to know something about what does it mean for something to fit in something else. It's not that it's really difficult to encapsulate all of the subtleties in language with a series of rules. And that was what was tried for a lot of years. Um, it takes a higher level of understanding of the language to be able to solve this routinely. And the cool thing about transformers is that they can learn to do this on their own, much like the convolutional net learned to separate dogs from cats just by looking at millions of images of dogs and cats that are labeled. Transformers do something similar. So um, the, the 
the technology that has really revolution, revolutionized things is called BERT and um, stands for bi-directional. Well, it doesn't matter what it stands for. Uh, BERT is uh, a Muppet, of course. And so now everything to do with transformers is, is associated with Mupp Muppets of one form or another. Uh, but anyways, you can just think of this as a uh, BERT, like the Sesame Street character, is a very powerful algorithm developed by Google that can learn on its own to do amazing things with uh, human language. And the basic structure of it at a high level schematic looks like this. And each of those things called an E is referred to as an encoder. And basically that takes language in and produces a representation out. Um, there are 12 of them in the base language model and altogether this thing has 110 million trainable, tunable parameters. So you can see, and that this is a small one, by the way, the, the, the current state of the art, we're up into the hundreds of trillions of parameters. But back in the late 2018, uh, 110 million parameters is still a lot, way too many to tune by hand. You, you spend a whole lifetime and not get through all of them. So this is something that has to be done automatically. And the way you do this is you feed it a piece of text. In this case, we'll feed it the sentence, the trophy would not fit because the blank was too small. You randomly uh, replace 15% of the words with a token, the mass token, and you train, you give this to the system and ask it to predict what the missing word is. So this gets fed into the system and it, ripples through this architecture. And at the output, it produces an output, the probability of the masked word for every word in its vocabulary. And these typically come with vocabularies of tens of thousands of words. So maybe 50 to 60,000 words. So it would make a prediction for every single one of the 50,000 words in its vocabulary. And over time, by doing this again and again and again, it would learn to reliably predict that the missing word in this case is suitcase, the word suitcase. It's, it's got the highest probability of all the words in its vocabulary. And what's neat about this is it's completely automatic. It doesn't require any human input because it randomly masks out a word and then learns to predict the missing word. And by doing this, you say, well, what's the point of doing this? Well, it forces this encoder, this transformer to learn about the syntax, the structure, and the uh, terminology of the language. It learns a lot about the language. And so once you've done that, you've got a, a thing called a trained language model. After you've done this, predict the randomly masked out word. And that kind of training can take a long time. Uh, when I did it uh, about two years ago on a small model, it took a week on a, a pretty powerful computer just running 24 seven for a week to, to teach it about the language of pathology. I'll get to that in a minute. But once you've got this model trained, we call that the trained language model. You're not done. Um, you want to apply this for some application. So once you've trained this language model, then when you feed text into it, so let's say we feed that same sentence in without any masked words. Now, this is just the text that you're interested in, in analyzing. You feed that in and what it produces as output is you can think of it as a fingerprint. It's a representation of that text that the computer, it has meaning and the computer uh, can manipulate it. It's a numerical representation of that text that has context and understands syntax and terminology. So once you've got that fingerprint from the text, then you feed it to an application tool tip. So for example, a common one is a question and answering system. So this is itself a distinct neural network and it requires its own set of training. So these things get trained in two phases. In the first phase, you train the main system to learn about the language and its structure and syntax. And in the second phase, you train a snap-on tool that you attach to it to perform a specific task. And BERT is really good at question answering. And there's a, a long-standing challenge in natural language processing um, to answer questions from things like Wikipedia entries. So this is an entry from Wikipedia. It's about the Normans. I'm not gonna read it to you, but you can ask questions and the answers to these questions are located as passages of text in this, in this paragraph. So in what country is Normandy located? Well, the answer is France, and there it is. When were the Normans in Normandy? 10th, 10th and 11th centuries. 
When did they first gain their separate identity? First half of the 10th century, who's the leader? And so on and so forth. So you can give this to undergrads <clears throat> or any, anybody, but they have given it to undergrads and recorded how they perform. And a typical uh, undergraduate student will get a little over 90% correct on answering these general questions from Wikipedia articles. And so there's been a lot of effort over the last decade to build computer systems to try and answer these questions. And when BERT was introduced on the scene in, in 2018, it quickly took over and learned, in fact, to surpass a human performance on these basic question answering uh, problems and to such an extent that they had to come up with a new challenge, a much more difficult question answering uh, challenge for it to, to try and perform on. But the, the takeaway is that uh, BERT is very good at reading passages of text and extracting answers to questions from that passage of text. There are a couple of uh, gotchas. The, it, the answer must be a contiguous passage in the text, and the way you phrase your question can have a real impact on the performance. So there's still a bit of tuning that needs to go on. Nevertheless, BERT has set you know, amazing human level performance on a wide range of uh, natural language processing tasks, these benchmarks. So my goal, when I, I soon after I got to Moffitt, they asked me if I could um, help them automatically extract tumor site and pathology from, or tumor site and histology from pathology reports. And this was just a couple months after BERT had been published. And I said, ah, I think I know the system, this brand new technology hot off the scene. So I started, I got busy and started working with BERT and transformers. And I had to train it in two phases. Phase one is to train the language model. <clears throat> and I wanted to build a transformer that understood the language of pathology. So I got almost 300,000 digital pathology reports from Moffitt. It was basically everything they had over the last 10 years. And I fired up that automated process where it would mask out 15% of the words and learn to predict the missing words. That took a week on a supercomputer for it to learn the language of pathology. But once I had done that, then I started the second phase, which is to train a snap-on tooltip to do question answering. And I trained it to find the answer to two hard-coded questions. The first question, what organ contains the tumor? And the second question, what is the type of tumor? Now, this phase of training requires some ground truth. It requires someone to actually have read that pathology report and say, oh, this is a tumor of the lung and it's an adenocarcinoma, for example. Someone has to have determined that. Well, fortunately, cancer centers all over the world have people called certified tumor registrars that operate a cancer registry. And they it's their full-time job. And it's a, a training program that's several years and it involves an internship. And they become certified to read pathology reports and extract information from them, like what organ is the tumor in and what's the histology. And the pathology reports can be really, really complex. So that's why it takes several years of training to get good at this. Uh, and these people do this for all sorts of purposes, not the least of which is to report back to state and national level agencies about the incidence and prevalence of different types of cancer. So we use data, ground truth data from these certified tumor registrars that was available to us at Moffitt as the ground truth to train this question and answer tooltip. And uh, it, it looked at everything that Moffitt sees, 193 different types of tumors across 214 sites in the human body. And these, uh, we didn't just extract the names, we actually then can map them onto a standard um, ontology, a standard coding system that's uh, created by the International Classification of Diseases for Oncology by the World Health Organization. And this is used in cancer centers all around the world to codify and classify uh, the site that the tumor is affected and the type of tumor that it is. So after I built and trained the system, we had, I had to test it to see how well it performed. And for this, I used just over 2000 completely sequestered pathology reports uh, that had been processed by the cancer registry. So we knew the truth, but the, the system I built had never seen these reports completely, 100% sequestered, never seen them until the test phase. So what we would do is we would uh, take a pathology report out of this test data set and feed it to cancer BERT, that's my pathology language model, and my tuned and trained question and answer head. So if we extract a, a report from the test data set and feed it in 
The output would be something like this, site, upper lobe, lung, and the histologies and adenocarcinoma. Uh, great. Uh, that in itself is quite useful to be able to do that. And that's something that'd be helpful to store in a database somewhere. But it'd be even more useful if we could map this onto the standardized codes. So I didn't actually stop there. I went on and trained a couple more instances. I took the same pathology language model, but I trained two additional new snap-on tooltips. One of them to take the an input phrase and map it onto a specific code and one to take the phrase and map it onto a histology code. And these codes, so if you put the phrases in, it would put something out like th these two values, C34.1 as the site and 8140 slash three as the histology. And these codes are in the purple book. They're in the, uh, the World Health Organization ontology system. Once you've got the predicted codes out, you can compare them back to the truth from the cancer register to see how well you did. And overall, uh, the system worked amazingly well. Um, we would report not we report the, our five best guesses as to what the the site and histology were the five highest ranked answers. A lot of the time, it was, it was pretty confident that, that the top ranked answer was the correct answer, but we nevertheless would return the top five. And if you look at how often the correct result was in the top five, it was around 95%. And again, across all sites and histologies that a huge cancer center might encounter over a decade. And, and here's an example. Hi, so this is a program I've written to demonstrate Cabernet in action. And I'm gonna go over the major uh, parts of the display here. So uh, at the top, the title, Pathology Export, uh, Report Extraction Review. This block of text is the pathology report and you can scroll through it and you can see that it's quite long. It's, uh, very complex, a lot of information in there. Um, up at the top, uh, I've added a tool which actually screens the pathology report to determine if there's a malignancy. And you can see here that it's determined that this report does contain a positive, at least one positive indication. This uh, report also happens to be part of our sequestered test data set. So we do have the ground truth available from the cancer registry and that's listed here. And you can see the site is endometrium and the histology is adenocarcinoma endometrioid. Down here are the answers to various um, pre-specified questions, including what's the tumor site and what is the tumor histology. And you can see if I click on these pull-down menus, it's showing the top five results. But in this particular case, it's basically essentially 100% certain that the site is endometrium. And that happens to agree with the cancer registry. And in terms of histology, again, it's pretty much, uh, you can click on this to see the top five answers, but it's basically 100% certain that this is endometrioid adenocarcinoma, and that happens to agree with the cancer registry. Now, I've also started to extend the system by uh, asking it to answer predefined questions related to tumor size, stage, grade. And um, you can see that these are the answers to the various questions are outlined in color in the, in the text. So site and histology are outlined in the sign color. So you can see histology here, adenocarcinoma, adenocarcinoma endometrioid. If you scroll down, there's endometrium is the site. These new questions are uh, the answers are outlined in yellow. So FIGO grade one is the grade. Uh, this is the size that it's determined. You can see it says tumor measures such and such a size and uh, the tumor stage has got to be in here somewhere there it is primary tumor PT PT1B is the stage um, what's cool about this is you aren't just restricted to predefined questions I've added a field over here where you can type in a question and ask it to go find the answer so let's uh, here's something the carcinoma involves more than 50% of the myometrium so let's see if it can find that so we know the answer to this um, how much of the, the myometry is involved? Hit return and then click on answer and it'll go look for it. And it says more than 50% over here. And it highlights it in red in the text and labels it as the answer, more than 50%. So there it found that, that's good. Let's there's type in some other things here. Uh, let's see. Um, 
how something a little more useful how many pelvic lymph nodes were examined question mark hit return it processes and codes the question click on answer and it goes and looks for the answer and it comes back with the answer of 21 should be highlighted in red there it is total number of pelvic nodes examined sentinel and non-sentinel 21 so that's pretty cool it found that so um, you can use this system pretty generally and uh, to answer to pull information out of pathology reports and then uh, we can tune it for other reports like radiology reports, just about any kind of uh, medical text. You could train it now. If you've got ground truth answers by an expert, uh, you could train a system to pull this out. Um, and but the cool thing about these transformers is they have applications beyond uh, human language. And one of the really interesting ones is protein folding. So protein folding is a problem that was uh, posed by the 1972 winner for the Nobel Prize in Chemistry who worked on, uh, on this uh, problem. He was working on amino acids. Um, and he uh, po posed this question and said, we should be able to predict the 3D structure of a protein given just the linear amino acid sequence that's encoded in our DNA. We should be able to figure out what that final protein looks like in 3D. And it's been an enormous grand challenge of uh, biology and medicine ever since for the last uh, 50 years. And um, even if you're not super familiar with it, basically the base pairs in our DNA combine in triplets to each specify amino acid. So you can think of our DNA as chains of amino acids and the amino acids get converted um, through the cellular process they get converted or used to construct proteins. And once the proteins are produced, they spontaneously fold and form a three-dimensional structure. And these structures are called the, the uh, engines of life. They're little machines that do various functions inside the cell and even outside the cell. Um, but they're basically the basis of life. And it's uh, Problems in either the genetic structure or the three-dimensional structure of the resulting proteins are the result of many, it caused many diseases, as you can imagine. So uh, DeepMind decided in 2018 that they would apply these transformer, this transformer technology to this problem. And they use these transformers not to encode language, but to encode amino acid sequences and also the three-dimensional geometry of the resulting protein. So there's lots of proteins where we know the amino acid and we also know the 3D structure through very laborious methods. And so they use that as ground truth to train these systems to try and predict the three-dimensional structure given the uh, amino acid sequence. And uh, a couple of years after they started on this work, they entered this uh, biannual competition that's been running for the last well, since the 90s. Uh, and it's basically a competition where uh, groups all around the world are given amino acid sequences to um, proteins that are not yet in the public. Uh, so a lab somewhere has figured out what the three-dimensional structure of the protein is using a very laborious process, but they haven't published the results. So it's not generally widely known what the three-dimensional structure of the protein is. You just get the amino acid sequence. So people are given this and asked to um, produce and upload their prediction of the three-dimensional structure. And then they're, they're judged on it by looking at how far apart the average distance between their prediction and the truth. Protein folding is one of these holy grail type problems in biology. We've always hypothesized that AI should be helpful to make these kinds of big scientific breakthroughs more quickly. We've been working on our system AlphaFold really hard now for over two years. Rather than having to do painstaking experiments, in the future biologists might be able to instead rely on AI methods to directly predict structures quickly and efficiently. We decided to enter CASP competition because it represented the Olympics of protein folding. CASP, we started to try and speed up the solution to the protein folding problem. When we started CASP in 1994, I certainly was naive about how hard this was going to be. CASP has a metric on which you will be scored, which is this GDT metric. On a scale of 0 to 100, you would expect a GDT over 90 to be a solution to the problem. If we do achieve this, this has incredible medical relevance. 
The implications are immense from how diseases progress, how you can discover new drugs. It's endless. Council started on Monday. Can I just check this diagram you've got here, John? This one where we ask ground truth. Is this one we've done badly on? We're actually quite good on this region. If you imagine that we hadn't have said it came around this way, but had put it yeah, in the right instead. Spot. Yeah. One of the hardest proteins we've gotten in CAS thus far is a SARS-CoV-2 protein uh, called ORF8. ORF8 is a coronavirus protein. We tried really hard to improve our prediction. <laughs> like, really, really hard. Probably the most time that we have ever spent on a single target. So we're about two-thirds of the way through CASP, and we've gotten three answers back. We now have a ground truth for ORF8, which is one of the coronavirus proteins, and it turns out we did really well in predicting that. Amazing job, everyone, the whole team. It's been incredible. Here what we saw in CASP14 was a group delivering atomic accuracy off the bat, essentially solving what in our world is two problems. How do you look to find the right solution and then how do you recognize you've got the right solution when you're there all right are we are we mostly here i'm going to read an email uh i got this from john malt i'll just read it, it says john as i expect you know your group has performed amazingly well in cast 14 both relative to other groups and in absolute model accuracy Congratulations on this work. It is really outstanding. AlphaFold represents a huge leap forward that I hope will really accelerate drug discovery and help us to better understand disease. It's pretty mind-blowing. You know, these results were, for me, having worked on this problem so long, after many, many stops and starts, and will this ever get there, suddenly this is a solution. We solved the problem. This gives you such excitement about the way science works, about how you can never see exactly or even approximately what's going to happen next. There are always these surprises, and that really, as a scientist, is what keeps you going. What's the, going to be the next surprise? So uh, this came out. Uh, they published the paper just earlier this year. This is the January 22, 2022 cover of Nature Methods, and it's all about uh, AlphaFold. And uh, DeepMind open sourced this uh, at when they published this paper. And at the same time, they worked with the European Bioinformatics Institute to release their prediction for the shape of every protein in the human proteome, over 20,000 proteins. So they're all there. You don't have to figure it out on your own anymore. And they also released the prediction for the, the complete proteomes of 20 other biologically significant organisms, another 350,000 proteins. And now they're working on doing every protein known to science, over 100 million proteins, and they'll all be in the database and publicly and freely available. <clears throat> so in this issue, the editors of Nature said, these deep learning based approaches have sent shockwaves through the structural biology community. We anticipate far reaching and long lasting impact. And if that pans out, um, that in my opinion, it's gonna to lead to a Nobel Prize in medicine. So this will be really cool if a piece of software and an AI tool um, <clears throat> is the first to win a Nobel Prize for a significant um, breakthrough in medicine and biology. So the last thing I'm gonna talk about briefly is images. It turns out you can apply transformers to images. Well, how do you do that? I mean, if they're made to do linear things like amino acids and language, how do you apply them to images? Well, you break the image up into chunks and you feed the chunks through a transformer architecture. And that can be used in turn to make predictions, just like the convolutional neural net. You can give it an image and have it tell you whether it's a bird, a ball, a car, a cat, or a dog. And what's interesting is they can perform on par with convolutional nets, but in general, it seems like they don't need as much training data. That has a lot of advantages. <clears throat> So this is an interesting demo. You can go on, I put the link there. You can go and play with this yourself online afterwards if you want. It's called DALI, which is a mashup of the artist Salvador DALI and Pixar's Wall-E, and you'll see why in a minute. But you can go on here and uh, type into uh, the prompt. You can say, uh, <clears throat> uh, 
produce an armchair in the style of an avocado and an armchair imitating an avocado. And this is fed into a transformer and the transformer then produces images. It doesn't look them up and search for images like Google images. It actually synthesizes and produces the images de novo. And it's been trained by giving it millions and millions of pairs of text descriptions and images. And from that, it's learned how to convert the text into the image. And this is what you get back. And again, these are not existing images. These were synthesized by the transformer after you typed in the prompt. And there's some really cool looking chairs there. <laughs> some that I wouldn't mind having <laughs> sitting in. Um, there's lots of examples. A purse in the style of a strawberry. And this comes out and you go, there's some actually pretty cool looking purses there. It's, it's pretty neat. A female mannequin dressed in a navy button down shirt and yellow jeans and out comes this. You can imagine how useful this would be for a designer to be able to produce these uh, images and incorporate them into documents or proposals or presentations without having to go and make them yourself or search for them on the internet. But it can also produce images of anatomy, for example, a cross-sectional view of a heart. And remember, it's, it, it doesn't really know anything about hearts. It's just learned that this phrase heart and these images that are out there are associated. And you give it the, this phrase and it'll produce these images. And here's the prompt for, for brain, a cross-sectional view of a brain. And some of these images are very realistic looking and some of them look like they're from aliens of some sort, but it's, it's still interesting the level of detail that it can produce. So what's a medical application of this? Well, if it generates images from text, could you revert, invert it? Could you produce text from images? Answer is yes, and there's tons of work on that, uh, not using visual transformers, but other techniques for several years. So we could train one of these transformers on pairs of medical images and the resulting reports that radiologists and cardiologists and dermatologists have produced. And we probably have a huge data set to do that here. And then we could use this to fill out boilerplate on a report and speed up the reporting process. So for example, you might feed it a, a CT scan, feed it through a transformer, and it would produce things like um, an indication of what the disease is and various other uh, points of interest from the images. And this could key the radiologist to look for certain things and at the very least might help speed up the process. And I would call this Dr. E. Ladd because it's dally in reverse because it starts with the images and goes to the text instead of the other way around. So an, another application in electronic health records, we have three kinds of data, fixed, time varying and missing data. We could feed these through transformers uh, and generate fingerprints and use these fingerprints to predict things that are of interest. For example, is this patient gonna be here a long time, three weeks or more? Uh, if we discharge them, how likely is it they'll be come back within a month? Um, you know, all kinds of things we could predict based on the electronic health record. And if we can use this type of technology for text and images and genetic sequences, the next step is something that is, could be really revolutionary, which is to implement something equivalent to Google search across all patient data. This doesn't exist now. You can't go into the hospital and search for arbitrary things. But if we can encode all this data, say every night we run a batch job and take all the new data and run it through our system and generate fingerprints for all the different kinds of data produced that day in the hospital, we could store those fingerprints. And then we could build a system that would let a radiologist do something like find images, find patients who have images with a lesion that looks like this, and they draw a box in the image, and up immediately comes patients over in the last decade that have images that look, had a lesion that looked like that in their MRI. And with that comes the entire patient record, what they were treated with, what their outcome was, enormously valuable. And you can do searches across all different kinds of data, genetic data, uh, patient reported outcome data, drug data, all sorts of things. And again, if you wanna do this today, you have to hire someone and get them to go through the electronic system page by page by page and search for these individually. And this really slows down enrollment in clinical trials. So uh, kind of rattled through a bunch of things there, but this is the type of stuff that we're thinking about and working on uh, with, the, with the new uh, team here in Edmonton and uh, happy to take any questions you might have. So Ross, uh, Doug Stettner here. Um, I'm hey, working Doug. now down at UQ in the uh, Institute for Molecular Bioscience. And 
a lot of the guys around here are saying, mm, we want to do something with AI. Uh, you know, can, what what hardware should we be buying now for two years down the road? And we're like, you know, give us give us a break. We have no idea what's going to be there. But in general, what are you using? Basically, massive GPU supercomputers or um, so in general, if you can use the cloud, that's my recommendation, especially if you're new to it, just go to the cloud, try things out. And because um, uh, if you buy a big GPU supercomputer, they depreciate like crazy. In two years, they'll be worth like 10% of what you paid for it. So if, you, if the duty cycle on that system isn't high, like well over 50%, you're better off going to the cloud. So yeah, I, we're using lots of GPUs to do this stuff. Now the okay. trick with with uh, healthcare data is uh, it's very difficult to move it to the cloud because of privacy and legal issues. So in in Edmonton, we're actually still buying hardware on prem. We're not using the cloud, but that will change. Yeah, yeah. here 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 we're doing the same. We uh, the cloud. I mean, you know, in theory, it all sounds great, but when you finally price it all out and the amount that we yep. actually, you know, our yep. duty cycle is incredible. So yep. um, yeah, we, we just can't afford to, to cloud it, but um, yeah, we, we do currently have, uh, you know, a dedicated GPU super and yeah, I, I think that's the only way that it's going to go ahead, but um, yeah, it, it's just curious to see what you guys are using. Thanks. Yep. Nice talk. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Donna Linskog, I um, I saw you had lots of computer science training to get into all this, but where did you get all the medical training? Like, did you get specialized training along the line, along the way, or is this uh, picked up as you go? Picked up as I went, three decades working closely with doctors in the hospital. So my philosophy is to be uh, closely integrated in the healthcare uh provider's domain. So we aren't over in the engineering or computer science building. We're in the hospital and we go to rounds. I'll take my students and my trainees and we'll go to like when I was in Calgary for 10 years, I attended stroke rounds every week, every single week uh -huh. and uh, MS rounds. And so it takes about a year to, to really get a handle on the lingo. And right. then you can start to converse with the physicians. And, and like at Moffitt, I was part of the sepsis team and the quality improvement team. We built an algorithm to predict sepsis for bone marrow transplant patients at Moffitt. And in order to do that, you have to be integrated with the nurses and the infectious disease docs who are actually treating the sepsis on the ward. So you, you pick it up over time. Interesting. So they don't require you to know that to work with you. They just um, are willing yeah. to just talk to you to teach you. <laughs> exactly, right? Because it, it requires a village, right? The, the, the problems are interdisciplinary and really hard. So mm -hmm. it's it's not practical to expect one person to master everything. So you got to work with a team. Nice. Thank you. We can also take questions in the chat if you like. So there was one question um, about I. So um, IBM's commercial failure of Watson Health that included cancer imagery. Yeah. If uh, the Watson is being Watson Health is being sold for scrap now, quote unquote. Yeah. <laughs> do you have any yeah. uh, thoughts about that or insights? Yeah, I do actually. So um, one of their um, early on in the early days of Watson Health, they uh, approached us at Mayo. I was at Mayo Clinic at the time, and um, they approached leadership at Mayo Clinic to uh, get them to purchase. Uh, Watson. It, it wasn't a product, but you still, the way IBM works often is you have to pay them to do their beta testing for them. Let me just put it that way. Um, so anyways, they approached Mayo Clinic to, to do a collaborative effort with them in which Mayo Clinic was going to pay them like $100 million to get going with Watson Health. And uh, so the folks at uh, leadership at Mayo asked me to talk to um, the person at IBM who was in charge of the um, the medical imaging component of Watson. 
And so I managed to arrange a, a discussion with her. Um, and it became very apparent to me very quickly that they are very much not doing what I like to do. So what I just said to, you know, previous question, answer the previous question that you need to embed the AI and the computer science guys in the clinical environment. Um, IBM's approach was we'll build it, throw it over the fence to you and you use it. And, you know, I asked the leader of the medical image CIV is what they called this project. I said, who are you working with? Like how many radiologists are on your team? And she said, well, none, we don't need any radiologists. And, and uh, you know, how many CT techs are working? Oh, we don't need input from those people. And I realized right there and then that this, this was doomed, right? There's, it's really, really easy to spend a lot of money building complex AI systems that are gonna fail. And uh, most are headed that way, unfortunately. And hopefully IBM has learned their lesson. Um, and so this is part of the reason why a lot of this work has to be done behind the firewall at academic healthcare centers. You can't farm this problem out to Amazon or, or Microsoft or Google because until they are operating and running networks of hospitals that see vastly complex cases in huge numbers, they just won't have the in-house expertise to tell you what the important problems are and help you get there. So that, that's how we work. That's how I work in my lab. We don't just build something and toss it over the wall. We work iteratively uh, break things, break them quickly, and learn to fix them and get input from the docs and the nurses. That's how you make something that's going to work. They didn't do that. Okay. Any other, anyone else with questions? Just for curiosity's sake, are you aware of anything happening at uh, Saskatchewan Health? Well, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So there's a couple of people. There's a, a person at the University of Regina who's actually got a chair in artificial intelligence. Um, I don't think she's working on health, but there are several people at the University of Saskatchewan who are working on AI and health. Absolutely. So I have a question in the chat. What is the current status of AI ML in predicting the prognosis of diseases or aging? Um, so uh, aging uh, is really tough because different people age at different rates. But in terms of prognosis for various, um, th there's lots and lots of systems that are very good at predicting outcomes. Um, you know, is, is this person going to respond to this treatment? Um, is this person going to go on and develop more severe disease or less severe disease? Is the tumor going to get bigger or smaller? Those sorts of systems are being produced by the thousands, literally by the thousands. There's thousands of publications every year doing exactly that. So the issue is that very, very few, almost none of those are translated into clinical practice. So uh, a lot of them are generated through these sorts of competitions. Like there's, there's one that I've been following for several years uh, that is to uh, segment or outline brain tumors for treatment planning and surgical planning and all those sorts of things. And uh, this has really caught the attention of AI scientists around the world. And there's a big competition that's held every year and they have a public domain data set of brain tumors and they have the, the uh, very high quality outlines that were produced by trained neuroradiologists. So it's as close to truth as we can get. And so people download this and train their system. And then there's a sequestered test set that they apply their algorithm to. And at the meeting every year, they compare each other's results. So each year, there's probably at least a thousand publications on new ways to segment brain tumors. But if you look in the FDA's page of cleared medical devices, there are none for AI tools for segmenting brain tumors, zero right now, absolutely none. So what's happening if we have a thousand new papers published every year and absolutely no tools going into clinical practice? And that's because there's this vast gulf divide between publishing a paper and actually turning it on in the healthcare system and having it provide the right information to the right team at the right time and having them trained to respond to the information. And so that is a lot of what I was doing at, at my later stages at Mayo and also at Moffitt was trying to cross that divide and it's extremely difficult. So um, 
it's it's actually more than half the work, vastly more work to translate a good algorithm into clinical practice than it is to build the algorithm in the first place, in my experience. So I don't know if I exactly answered your question, but th that's basically what's going on. Do you think that'll become easier? Uh, yeah, it will. It, yeah, it's going to take a lot of hard work. But over the next decade, I hope it becomes much, much easier. And that's part of what my pitch is to the University of Alberta is that we need to make it vastly easier. Uh, that you shouldn't have to, if you're a, a clinician and you have a smart resident or fellow and you've got this cool idea about trying to predict something about your patients on the ward, you shouldn't have to come to me or my students to get that built, right? Because then we become the bottleneck. We want to invert that funnel and make it so everybody has access to powerful AI tools that can probably do 80, 85% of the problems. They can just do it on their own. And then if they run into problems, they can come to us and maybe we can help. But uh, we shouldn't be the first point of contact. We should be a ladder point and just support to help them solve their cool problems. That's 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 what we have to do in healthcare: is make it a tool, AI for all. Everybody in the, in the hospital gets access to these tools to build models. I think there's a little bit of danger there in making the people understand the limitations of it though so yeah. that yeah. they don't yeah. throw this thing in and say oh it's gospel this is the outcome <laughs> you know uh, yeah, that, absolutely. that's always a dangerous bit so so um when once you built a model this is the other thing that's not talked about a lot is if i build a model today it's not going to make predictions on patients on the ward tomorrow right that just does, it just doesn't happen that way um what happens is uh, like the sepsis model that i built at moffitt um, we run that in silent mode and it was uh, until we get enough statistical, enough data to prove that it actually makes a difference. And in that case, it was going to take about a year. So we were going to have to run this silently in the background, making predictions on every patient in the bone marrow transplant ward every day. And then once a month, uh, we would review that the plan. We didn't get to the stage, but the plan was to review that with the quality and the sepsis committee to look back over what had happened the previous month to see how the algorithm did. And it's going to make mistakes it's, and you use that information to tune it and try and improve it. But most important of all, you use that period to build trust because the frontline workers in the docs don't want another black box thrown at them telling them how to do their job. They want a tool that's going to help their life, not make it more difficult. And to get there, you have to build trust in the tool. So they, they have to use it for a good while before they feel comfortable with it. So really what you're doing is you're building a new intervention. It's sort of like building a drug. A lot of physicians don't know the biochemistry of how the drug works, but they trust that it does because it went through a clinical trial, a big clinical trial, and they, they showed that it helped. You have to do the same thing with these AI tools. You can't just build them and chuck them into practice. You got to go through that testing and vetting and trust building phase, and you can plan on at least a year of that. So I have one more question from the chat and then maybe we can wrap it up. It's been a great talk. If you were to recommend one source to follow up to keep to follow to keep up on information regarding AI and health, what would it be? Is there a website or a journal or some I, other source? I, I'm subscribed to at least a half a dozen different um, reports that come out, uh, some daily, some weekly. Um, so there, there's no one source right now. Um, I, I, I read Medium a lot. Um, I subscribe to several AI newsletters that have bits and pieces about health in them. But the thing is that what we're, we're at the stage now in health where we're taking things that have been developed for other areas, for other applications, and trying to apply them into health. Uh, that's a lot of what we're doing because the, the progress is so rapid and so phenomenal in other areas that we're just trying to piggyback off of that. There is original work being done in health too, of course, but it's very important to keep track of what's happening in AI as a general field. And, uh, you know, something like Transformers 2018, they appeared on the scene and in three years, they've completely revolutionized natural language processing with tons of clear applications in healthcare. If you're not following what's happening in general AI, you're not going to pick up on that. And there's no one source right now, unfortunately. Okay. 
So please help me uh, thank Ross for a wonderful presentation tonight. Thank you for taking some time from your, of your evening to join us. And we hope um, we'll be in touch again with you relatively close by in Edmonton. Yeah, thanks very much for the invitation. It was a pleasure. Okay, thanks again. Take care, Bye. everyone. Bye.